My next speaker is um, Dr. Yasir Kazi. After serving as an assistant professor of medicine at Erie County Medical Center and then starting the first pancreas transplant program at the Erie County Medical Center in Buffalo, New York, Dr. Kazi moved to uh, Southern California to head the kidney pancreas transplant program at Keck School of Medicine at USC. Dr. Kazi has received over $3 million in research grants and has authored numerous papers and publications. His current area of interest includes utilization of biomarkers for improving kidney transplant outcomes. In addition to his clinical and research uh, endeavors, Dr. Kazi is currently the director of the Kidney Transplant Fellowship Program and has trained several fellows in the field of transplant nephrology. So with that, uh, it's, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to, to introduce Dr. Kazi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rostogi. Um, thank you, Natera, for inviting me. Um, it's um, a pleasure to present our data on how we have incorporated genetic testing in our transplant setting. Um, as we know, uh, kidney transplant offers the best form of renal replacement therapy for individuals who are thought to be deemed appropriate candidates uh, with a quality of life and a survival advantage. Um, uh, as of December 2018, there's about 500,000 patients that are uh, on dialysis, and about 90,000 of them are awaiting a kidney uh, transplant. Um, End-stage renal disease, as we know, is on the rise, and um, other than some uh, states in the south, uh, Southern California is uh, the incidence of uh, end-stage renal disease is um, definitely on the rise, and with the shortage of organs, uh, unfortunately, our patients uh, are waiting, and it's not uncommon for some individuals to wait about a decade before they get a kidney transplant. Um, a recent paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, uh, reassured that there have been improvements in the 10-year uh, survival outcomes. Um, but again, we are still losing allografts, about 35 to 40 percent of them, 10 years um, after uh, transplant. And, and while there has been a survival advantage um, that kidney transplant has been shown, once allografts fail and people go back on dialysis, we know that the mortality goes up significantly, um, both as a result of cardiovascular and infections. Um, so it becomes really imperative uh, to make sure that the kidneys um, last uh, for um, as long as possible and we can identify the etiology of what is causing allograft dysfunction. Um, this paper looked at the, uh, the, the, I tried to identify the specific causes of kidney loss and as we can see, uh, while rejection and medical complications are important components early on, it really is glomerular lesions and fibrosis, uh, unchecked fibrosis in the allograft that is causing the eventual demise of the allografts. Uh, and there have been several registries that have uh, actually looked into the incidence of uh, recurrence and then the impact that recurrence has. And uh, there is a substantial graft loss that can happen once the diseases come back, especially with uh, some um, glomerular nephritis. Um, <clears throat> so it becomes important in trying to identify the etiology of the end stage renal disease, both for the recipient and the live donor. Um, I've, um, I mentioned that the wait time in some regions of the country is almost a decade. Um, so of course, we try to promote living donors, uh, but about 10 to 25% of the patients uh, may notify CKD that is of a familial, um, uh, with some familial history, so it becomes imperative that we, can, we uh, identify it so that it does not have any consequences on the donor. Um, the great thing has been the introduction of diagnostics in our field, and uh, just in the past few years, we've uh, seen uh, so many biomarkers that have been added on uh, to our clinical practice that we are uh, detecting injury early on. Uh, in addition to biomarkers in the blood, we are also now having a more sophisticated microscopy that is helping us identify uh, and find out what the etiology of the injury might be. This is a slide I made about two years ago, and uh, just within the past two years, now we are incorporating genetic testing into this um, as well. Um, so when we see a patient in our transplant clinic, it sort of hits a hard reset. It gives us an opportunity uh, to uncover an etiology that might have been missed. Um, it's not uncommon for individuals to never have uh, sought healthcare, and the first time they actually present 
uh, with ESRD, it's their initial presentation. They end up in an emergency room. All of us have seen patients with uh, a hypertensive crisis or nosebleeds. Um, and, and subsequent to that, they end up on dialysis and there really has not been an effort to uncover what original cause of uh, the ESRD was because the kidneys are shrunk um, and it's way too late. On the other hand, we might have patients that have contraindications to a biopsy, so the etiology was really not uncovered. So when a patient does get referred over to a transplant center, uh, we begin the process of trying to uncover what it uh, might have been, and uh, we spend some time. It's not uncommon for us to like try and see if they've had a biopsy at some other institution to seek uh, to uh, to get those results. Uh, the problem is most of the times these histopathologic uh, lesions aren't really specific to a, a diagnosis, to a cause, uh, and are not unique. And they don't really um, sort of uh, have specific therapy, uh, nor are all kidney diseases diseases of the kidney. Um, and uh, over the years, we're starting to recognize uh, that it is sort of, as an example, um, a TMA we're finding a, a mutations that is kind of like uh, giving us a better insight into what might have been the etiology for some of those conditions. And to some extent, historically, nephrology has kind of like been defined by what we saw in pathology. So if we saw something like this, we call it membranous. We're not finding out that there might uh, be an antibody called the PLA2R antibody. And now we're finding that there might be um, sort of genes that might be predisposing individuals for this. So it's sort of kind of like We've kind of existed backwards when it is now at a time that we are discovering genes that are helping us maybe put all the pieces together. And you've heard uh, in the sessions earlier today how next generation sequencing is helping us understand the, the molecular pathogenesis uh, of disease. And uh, not only are we just uh, discovering genes, there is an effort to try and put clinical um, sort of a, a symptomatology in the context of these. For example, uh, we are now looking at uh, the po uh, uh, um, coenzyme Q-related mitochondrial dysfunction in the podocyte, and there's now the potential of giving them therapy and halt the progression of the disease. In a similar way, the cholesterol efflux and um, metabolism in the podocyte is now the source of a study that would prevent the progression of Alport syndrome using a drug like uh, Izatimibia in a trial in, uh, in, in Miami. So um, there are a lot of recent uh, publications and papers that are demonstrating the, uh, the ability to detect genetic variants. And just to quickly um, go over a, a summary of some of them, we heard about the Groupman paper um, Again, landmark paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, 3,000 patients uh, with, a, with an incidence of about 9%, uh, and about two-thirds two of these were autosomal dominant, and, um, uh, and few patients actually had a double mutations that were discovered. This was a study that actually looked at the incidence in, uh, of genetic uh, disorders in, in families. So that while the previous paper was across the board, uh, 3,000 patients, this was more specifically related uh, to the families. And you can see the, uh, the, the rate of picking up on a mutation went from about 9% to about 40% when you had, um, when you had uh, genetic, uh, when you had a family history. Um, another paper, uh, almost uh, the same, about um, 70%, if you had a family history, a higher rate of detection of uh, mutations. If you had extra renal manifestations, um, again, uh, you were able to uh, pick up more mutations. So uh, the testing was able to help confirm diagnosis. It was able to even establish diagnosis in some individuals um, that did not have a diagnosis uh, before. Um, we um, heard about the pediatric paper. This was a study from um, the Boston um, uh, program, and you know they found a mutation in a significant number of patients as well. Again, sort of suggesting if there was a family history, the yield of detecting these uh, tests was um, pretty significant. Now, um, there's been some recent literature that has been looking in, uh, into the transplant as well, and two uh, uh, papers that I'm showing you are from just uh, this year, a study from Germany which uh, looked at their wait list um, and, and kind of worked folks up if they had not had a diagnosis.
So uh, if you can see on the right, it's sort of like the algorithm they used. Uh, basically, if you were less than 40, if you had an unusual etiology like FSGS, um, uh, so uh, they, they tested those folks for uh, genetic testing and identified mutations, again, in a significant number of patients, about 20%. Um, and, um, and, and many of them uh, pathogenic. Uh, there was another study from uh, China who kind of looked at the same, or broke it down by familial uh, or folks that did not have a family history. And, and again, uh, the rates sort of correlate what other uh, investigators are basically seeing. Uh, interestingly, in this paper, they also identified some oncogenes. And as transplant nephrologists, we're always worried about uh, post-transplant malignancies. Uh, so the ability to detect oncogenes um, seem to help at least guide management or uh, you know, pro be more proactive about looking into that. Um, so collectively, the, the data that I have shown you sort of suggests that it is possible to identify monogenic um, genetic mutations, especially if there is a strong family history, if there's an early onset of um, chronic kidney disease, if it, there's an unknown cause, and uh, there is an extra renal manifestation. So um, with all this data that has been coming out, it becomes important to see what role genetic testing can play uh, in kidney transplantation. And obviously, we're looking at it both from a recipient standpoint um, and uh, the live donors to whom we basically want to make sure that um, they do not have any uh, risk factors long term. Um, I talked about the importance of recurrence in terms of the uh, long term um, uh, survival of the allograft, but there are other things that uh, are also important uh, in terms of what implications the etiology might have. Um, and I want to underscore the importance of putting the diagnosis right. Um, in the United States, when somebody goes on the wait list, they are assigned a score called the estimated post-transplant survival. Basically looking into four variables, uh, age, whether they were on dialysis, if they were on re uh, previous uh, uh, recipients. Um, and, uh, and what is important is like, if they are diabetic or if they're not diabetic. So I've put up two scenarios for the same age, same duration on dialysis, and uh, give them the diagnosis of diabetes and not. And you can see that they become eligible for the best quality kidneys if they have a better, uh, if they have a lower estimated post-transplant survival. So in a, it becomes really important to identify. Literally the day I made this slide, next day in the clinic, the first patient that I saw had a history of diabetes, but no diabetic retinopathy, was not on any diabetic medication, had been on some steroids, so clearly diabetes may not have been her, uh, her original etiology, but if that got put on the form, there is a chance that she may lose out on potentially uh, good quality kidneys because uh, the, the estimated post-transplant um, score works out uh, to be different. So uh, I sent a, a genetic testing on her and uh, this was just a few days ago. So obviously it'll be something that we look into because we definitely don't want them to be disadvantaged on not being able to get a good quality kidney uh, as a result of an inaccurate uh, diagnosis. Uh, while uh, th th there is also a lot of work happening in terms of assessing uh, for rejection and, uh, and tolerance, while this is not part of the genetic testing that we have been doing, but just to kind of uh, kind of show you guys, literature is looking into a particular gene sequences that might be promoting tolerance or putting people at risk, um, and also whether individuals may be at a risk of developing post-transplant diabetes and um, malignancies. Um, so that was sort of like covering up the genetic testing in recipients, but more importantly, uh, how does it incorporate into the live donor um, um, sort of situation? And again, the fundamental of live donor is to make sure a nephrectomy is not going to have any negative consequences on an individual uh, in their uh, in their lifetime. And while um, it is, we've had excellent outcomes. Uh, there are in, uh, reports that have suggested somewhat of an increased risk uh, in uh, developing end stage kidney disease. Disease and uh, and the rates seem to be higher if there is a, a, a familial uh, if the donor is related to the recipient suggesting a genetic component. So how can we take genetic testing to better 
uh, give a, sort of a prognosis long term in terms of um, the outcomes of an individual who's got, undergone a nephrectomy, especially if there's been family history. Um, is, transplant programs are actually required to have some sort of a strategy for uh, c conditions like PKD. So, uh, and, and if, especially if the disease is unknown, it's sort of incumbent on the transplant program to kind of like assess, uh, you know, some of those things when having the discussion with the donor. Uh, so just a couple scenarios. We had a great uh, session earlier today on um, the African-American ancestry and the impact it has. Over the past uh, uh, eight or nine years, we've had excellent reports, and uh, I, I've put this uh, sort of as a summary slide and uh, a great uh, paper that uh, I sort of uh, would uh, um, recommend everybody take a look to kind of assess the impact uh, donation might have on individuals or African American ancestry. And uh, some of these papers are raising some concerns that there might be an increased risk of CKD and uh, end stage kidney disease after a living a kidney donation. Um, and as a result, there have been some investigators that have been looking into it. This, uh, this paper that looked at 136 African American uh, donors and broke it down into high risk um, because they were homozygous for the EPOL1, they did find lower baseline kidney function to start out with and somewhat of a faster rate of decline in the kidney function. Two out of the 19 individuals ended up being um, on dialysis. So, um, so it's sort of raising some concerns. And across the board, if you were to talk to transplant centers, and um, this paper published two years ago actually uh, looked at it, and about 50% of the centers were starting to offer um, the testing uh, to donors. About 4% of them were testing it routinely. 14% case by case, and uh, and then uh, most of the centers sort of felt that in the next coming years, there was gonna be an increased utilization of uh, the test in African-American donors. And as we heard earlier today, the concern really is shrinking the donor pool, especially in a group that already has uh, you know, smaller numbers to start out with. And while we always worry about do no harm to the donor, we don't factor in the psychological uh, harm it might do to, uh, let's say, a parent who wants to donate to their child and give them the best quality of life and a survival advantage. So, you know, um, there, uh, you know, people are really looking into it very closely and sort of the compromise as of now appears to be that if you have a younger donor who is homozygous, probably not consider them for being uh, donors, but older individuals uh, may uh, be may proceed with high risk uh, uh, variants. And uh, those that summary slide that I showed you, and, and that most of the uh, data sort of suggested, like if you had an older African-American donor, they were less likely as opposed to Caucasian, if there was a higher incidence when we looked back on the individual who had developed end-stage uh, uh, kidney disease. So it might actually be okay for an older individual uh, in this group so that we don't completely shrink uh, the donor pool. But if you were to ask transplant centers, there is uh, quite a bit of variability that we're kind of going through right now. Uh, we heard about the polycystic kidney disease and uh, I think Dr. Rostogi underscored the importance of how the diagnosis might actually, uh, we may have the wrong diagnosis. And by and large, uh, the imaging is really helpful in uh, in the PKD type one, because if you don't have um, the cyst by age 30, you can sort of exclude it. But the challenge is many times we have donors between the age of 30 and 40, and we are not really sure because as we heard, genes can mimic adult polycystic kidney disease. There's some limitations in terms of the imaging. Um, so really, uh, uh, if we are if we are not dealing with a classic um, ADPKD in a uh, in a recipient, there should be a lower threshold for doing a genetic um, testing. Um, this was a paper that sort of uh, tried to integrate imaging with um, with genetic testing, and by and large, what it is really um, coming to is like if the donor, as I mentioned, is between the age of 30 to 40 uh, or less than 40, you would go ahead and uh, um, try to do a genetic testing on the recipient, see what the mutation was, and then test the donor. Obviously, if they have the same mutation, you wouldn't um, consider them uh, and would con allow them to proceed if they um, don't. Um, <clears throat> living donors with thin basement membrane disease and Alport, I can say that genetic testing is really uh, disrupting the class classical uh, classifications that we've had um, in uh, in Alport, and, and a lot of this is because uh, for the longest time, um, you know, we did not really understand the the sort of um, the inheritance of it, and as uh, we uh, heard, Col four A three and four are like a, a, a pathogenic variant that might be present in about 1% of the population, but don't seem to have a significant 
significant impact on the renal function. And oftentimes as transplant uh, centers, we are trying to figure out whether somebody has 10 basement membrane disease and Alport, uh, and you know, we were talking how sometimes it's harder to do a kidney biopsy than to do an actual process of the living donation. But this might be a place where we could start out by genetic testing to get uh, a better feel for what a mutation might exist. And again, that has limitations as well. And this paper actually uh, challenges uh, the definition of um, autosomal dominant Alport syndrome and sort of suggests that we should um, call it uh, as sort of a, a variant that has, uh, you know, called for a mutation if we detect them and, uh, you know, consistent with thin basement membrane disease. And again, you know, uh, kind of like underscoring how our, uh, our terminology, I uh, suspect, in the next few years is going to change in some of these things. Um, two very nice papers, and you kind of heard a reference to this. One, because now we do have genetic testing, and historically we have transplanted people who might have had, you know, family members with Alport. Uh, there was this uh, nice case report where uh, the son who had uh, uh, an uh, autosomal recessive Alport, the dad later in life uh, did have some um, hearing impairment, but had excellent kidney function. The paper goes on to talk about how they, you know, the son had excellent kidney function, dad had been doing really well, gone into transplant Olympics, uh, but then later in life did develop some uh, uh, hearing issues and, and, and they were able to detect a mutation. Again, sort of, uh, sort of confirming that it, it, despite the fact that they had a mutation, the dad was still doing well. Uh, but again, the sort of limitations that not every diagnosis is completely exclusive and, and, and involves. And the second paper, which I found really interesting, uh, basically had a, a, a son who had an X-linked um, um, uh, Alport syndrome, and the mother who wanted to donate had hematuria since age 10. When they did the mutations, they were not able to find any mutation on her, but they went a step ahead uh, and then actually collected the podocytes in the, in the urine and then uh, uh, checked the maternal DNA between the peripheral blood, which was negative for any mutation, and that did uncover a call for a five a mutation in the mother. So as of now, the mother has not uh, donated, the son was uh, pre-transplant. Again, sort of underscoring our evolving understanding of um, some of these things that have sort of historically been there since Alport caught, called it Alport. Um, so um, overall, um, individuals with FSGS, uh, uh, donors with FSGS are always some, somewhat of a concern for a transplant program. My lie donor coordinator is so worried about it because we've had two donors that there was some um, recurrence into it. Uh, but fortunately, we are doing genetic testing. Um, uh, our understanding of this is evolving as, uh, as well. The, the Toronto um, GN network, which is one of the biggest longitudinal follow-up of individuals, had a paper where they looked up uh, and, uh, their FSGS cohort. And as you can see over here, you know, a substantial portion of those individuals were again detected with the call for a uh, a mutation. So again, uh, evolving our understanding um, of some of these conditions, and it would be reassuring for the family and the patient to kind of like overall know if we kind of lack certain mutations that they may be able to proceed and not um, really be as a, a high risk of recurrence. And <clears throat> as we as we start to think about it, I'm. Uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering if some of the, the lack of these, uh, you know, or these mutations do predispose to forming antibodies like we are used to when a bigger uh, gene uh, like uh, um, uh, the call for a 5 is deleted and, you know, if some of the recurrence. So we're starting to collect all our historic patients that had really uh, miserable uh, outcomes after uh, with, the, with the recurrence to kind of go back and see if we can do genetic testing. So, and I like uh, have my uh, contact information if there's any individuals that want like to collaborate with it would be uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, the two other conditions that you know do create some sort of an um, uh, discussion point are individuals that have had stones in the past. By and large, uh, a paper kind of looked into it, about 80% of the transplant programs don't have really strict guidelines on uh, preventing individuals, especially if they've just had one stone. But as you can see to the right, there are about 30 gene mutations that have now been uncovered in stone formers. So uh, if you have an extremely young donor, uh, the yield of detecting one of these mutations is pretty substantial. So there might be some value in kind of like getting to uh, the, the exact etiology. So corrective um, measures can be uh, sort of recommended uh, down the road to prevent any um, recurrence.
Um, so now, just to kind of like summarize what our experience has been with the uh, at, at, at USC. Uh, so our first patient was tested in May 2020, and it was basically used both in the pre-transplant um, as well as the uh, post-transplant um, settings. And the, the criteria kind of like was based off of what we really saw the literature looking again. You saw the studies were from all over the world, from the United States, from Ireland, from China, from Germany. Um, I'm forgetting one country, but you know, it's sort of like across the board, we're looking at, in, looking at this data come out suggestive that like if there's a family history, if there's an atypical presentation, if there was a, a young individual of, uh, with ESRD of an unclear etiology, um, there might be a higher yield uh, to, um, to, uh, to uncover uh, a mutation. So, uh, so far we've uh, tested it on 342 individuals and 60 of them had a positive result, uh, about 18%, kind of like consistent with what we've seen uh, in some of the data. Uh, but surprisingly, we had a higher rate of de uh, detecting variants of unknown significance of about 90%, uh, and an average age was about 49 years uh, in our group. And these are sort of like the uh, top five diagnoses of what we are seeing. Again, the col 4 a seeming to lead the way. Uh, some individuals uh, did actually have, uh, were homozygous for the EPOL1. Um, and sort of, uh, this is sort of like the summary of all the diagnoses uh, that we have um, sort of uh, made um, in, in these uh, individuals. Uh, and just to kind of like show you what sort of um, clinical implication it has had. So for one patient that was homozygous, uh, we had uh, her do daughter wanted to donate. So we kind of tested, the, the daughter was tested. She was, hetero uh, she was not homozygous. So we were able to proceed with the living donation in an African Amer uh, American woman. We had an elderly woman who we found um, called for a five mutation. And, um, you know, obviously we sent her for, for ENT opto eval. Uh, we checked for anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies and kind of informed our referring physician that, you know, she, just so that, uh, and obviously informed the patient uh, to let other family members know. Uh, there was actually another patient with a col 4 a that was actually transplanted at, uh, at UCLA and that had a, a diagnosis of GN. So uh, one wonders if she had a anti-GBM antibody as, as the cause of her first uh, loss of her first allograft. Uh, and then really interestingly, we found a red mutation in one of her patients, and then on further um, uh, questioning, found out that she had a maternal aunt with a thyroid cancer at our county hospital. Uh, and, and then we referred her over to our endocrine folks uh, to rule out multiple endocrine uh, neoplasia uh, syndrome. Again, um, you know, with immunosuppression, who knows whether she would have been at a higher risk of some of these malignancies. The fact that we were able to incorporate some of this decision-making um, kind of like um, uh, was uh, really good. Now, even on our variants of unknown significance, it has opened up our uh, eyes to uh, things that <clears throat> we may not have known. Like for uh, cystinosis, I have now been sending out white blood cell cysteine levels working with UCSD. It has opened up um, relationships with a company that does it in terms of like trying to find out, you know, uh, to challenge some of what we have sort of just assumed, like, you know, we're the white blood cell cysteine level, does it get impacted by immunosuppression if you have low white blood cell count? So these are things that their scientific liaison hasn't been able to answer. So we're working on some of these things and collecting data. Uh, patient with uh, oxaluria that we had, uh, again, it was a type 2 oxaluria, but then in, I informed the pathologist about it, and we were able to find a calcium oxalate crystal uh, inside, uh, inside the allograft uh, biopsy. Um, we had an individual with familiar Mediterranean fever that is being looked into amyloid because it sort of led on to some sort of um, cardiomyopathy, and then an individual with mitochondrial dysfunction. And as we know, sometimes we check for carnitine levels in patients. Um, so just to kind of like, uh, op it has really opened up beyond what we've conventionally looked, you know, in terms of uh, what else can be done in terms of improving some of these um, outcomes. Um, just a, this is still in works, uh, but uh, the lose algorithm that we have a recipient, um, if they are pre-transplant, if they get tested and we find a mutation uh, through our organ transplant tracking record through our otter, we um, are uh, trying to put up a clinical alert so that the donor can then be, uh, the, when the donor is tested, we can incorporate that uh, into it, um, as well as if they've not been transplanted themselves to put it in uh, the, uh, sort of uh, the post-transplant um, uh, assessment as well. 
Uh, a hard copy is provided uh, to the patient, uh, especially if there is a familial component that we want folks to um, pass the information on. And uh, obviously there is a, 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 the, the, there is a contact information for, to, with the, to the genetic counselor um, in case uh, uh, the patient or the family wanted to um, uh, explore this uh, further. So uh, to summarize, I just want to sort of um, suggest that the, the, the overall, of course, the phenotype is a combination of the genotype and, and the environment. And, uh, you know, I'm in Hollywood, so I'm going to let Arnold Schwarzenegger from the Twins uh, movie explain uh, the situation when he's trying to tell Danny DeVito, like, we're, we're twins, we're basically same. And, you know, Danny DeVito is having none of it. He's, he's like, so if we're alike, then why are we so... God bleep different. And he goes, well, don't forget, I was taken to a beautiful island. I was cared for, loved, and, uh, you know, you had nobody. Uh, so, so the bottom uh, line is, like, we're entering this phase where uh, we really do have to incorporate, uh, you know, all these things together. And I'm hoping we're entering a, sh a sort of, there's a shift in the paradigm. We're entering an era where the genetic uh, data does get incorporated into the, the clinical, the morphological, and the, the pathological, uh, pathophysiological understanding um, so we can incorporate the eventual goal of medicine, which is personalized patient management, both in nephrology and transplant nephrology. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, I just wanted to leave my contact information over here uh, for uh, folks, uh, and I also want to take a, I want to th thank Natera for helping with the uh, data. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Kazi. Thank you, Dr. Stoke. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much. That was actually an excellent uh, presentation on the role of gene testing in in transplant, uh, both both pre and post, but also for living donors. And I think the other point that I just want to uh, reinforced that Dr. Kazi mentioned is getting the right diagnosis. This is very, very important. And I think Dr. Um, Wang went over this as well, in which he mentioned that the retesting or, or actually correcting the diagnosis is actually uh, important. 